So Israel has just been attacked again by Iran, okay? Nobody knows what is happening in the Middle East, but the markets are crashing. Bitcoin crashed by over $6,000 in a matter of minutes earlier today, but it's rebounded all the way back up to $65,000. And all of the different charts, I'm going to show you guys today is going to give us a clue about what is actually happening in this war in the Middle East. So before we get into what's happening in the markets, I want to show you guys what is happening in Iran and Israel right now. So as we can see, this video was dropped on Twitter literally from Iran attacking Israel. And we also can see from a few of the other videos and images that this war is all throughout Israel. Okay. The attacks coming from Iran are absolutely everywhere in Israel. Now, again, massive caveat where caveats are due. I am not an expert on the war in the Middle East. I am not an expert on anything happening in Israel, Palestine, or what Iran is doing much more focused on what is happening in the markets. I'm just going to show you what I have found on Twitter. I think Twitter is the best news source of what is going on right now regarding this war because you're getting up-to-date live action and live videos from people on the ground in Israel. So again, massive caveat. I'm an idiot. I'm a 27-year-old Australian bogan who cuts his own hair. I'm not a geopolitical expert, but I'm interested in the economics of what is potentially going on with this attack and how it could potentially relate to Bitcoin and the broader markets. Uh, so we can see pretty clearly here that the attacks are everywhere in Iran. Now, this image here is pretty fascinating because it's actually showing you the defense system being used by uh, Israel on the ground. Okay, so I'm going to blow this image up full screen for you guys to see. Uh, and you guys can kind of see what is actually happening on the ground in Israel right now. Okay, so Iran has actually came out and they've actually said, look, the attacks right now uh, have satisfied uh, you know, what is going on now? I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to show you guys a tweet from the minister of uh, Iran. Uh, if I can find it, well, here, here, here's a, uh, here's another video. Iran's counter attack has inspired an uprising. Naturally, there's, you know, wars on the street. There is all sorts of chaos going on right now. Can't find the tweet that I was going to uh, show you, but here's another one showing the bombs being dropped from Iran on Israel. An absolutely horrific situation. It's, oh, it's pretty amazing that people are honestly just filming this live. This is again. This is one of the the good things of the internet. You get live twenty four seven coverage of what is actually happening. Uh, we can see Alex Kruger tweeted something about the markets. Okay, Iran attacked Israel. Wild volatility again. This is not about neither charts nor fundamentals. This is about war headlines and managing risk smartly. If war escalates. We are going much lower. This is what Alex Kruger thinks. If there is no follow-up from Israel, we recover the entire dump. Hard to imagine no follow-up, but who knows? Good luck, friends. So he's talking a little bit about the markets. Let's have a look at what's actually happening in the market. So I'm going to zoom all the way in and show you guys uh, what happened earlier today. Uh, so we can see Bitcoin created from $67,000 to $60,800 in the matter of under one hour. But have a look at that massive doji candle. Someone was obviously waiting there with an enormous amount of buy orders. And you can see every single time Bitcoin actually has uh, touched that kind of 60K level, you can see somebody has been buying the dip aggressively. Okay, We're going to look at the broader markets in a, in a moment, but just have a look at what happens to Bitcoin every single time it gets into that you know, $60,000, $61,000 zone. Somebody's been buying the dip pretty aggressively. When you slap this puppy on, let's say, like a two-hour candle, you can see uh, Bitcoin has bounced a lot. It's bounced from 60,000 back up to 65,000. Uh, so again, that's interesting. Uh, the markets right now are not open. Obviously, it is the weekend. But something interesting about the markets was the fact that gold showed you that something was brewing last week. Uh, gold has broken out 
of this kind of consolidation range that it has been in over the past four years. You can see that gold tried to break above this, you know, 20,000, uh, sorry, $2,050 level on four different occasions. And literally a couple of weeks ago, it broke out aggressively and it's been actually rallying relatively parabolically for gold. Okay. Again, gold has a massive market cap for it to rally by 22% in the matter of one month. That's showing you that something big in the markets is happening. Okay. Gold is a $12 trillion asset class for it to rally by 22% in a month. That's massive. Somebody was plowing a lot of capital into gold over the past month, okay? Somebody said, okay, I want to risk off trade, okay? We all know that gold is a, you know, it's a flight to quality. It's a safe haven asset. People buy gold when they're worried about the financial system. People buy gold when they're worried about what is going to happen next, okay? Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the markets and Bitcoin and the broader geopolitics of what's going on. I want to first hit the live chat. Uh, so Buddy Max says, why wouldn't Bitcoin be moving up on the war news? So we're going to actually show you guys a chart of what happened with Bitcoin during the very beginning of the Israel and Palestine war. And we're also going to be showing you another chart showing you how Bitcoin uh, behaved during the March 2023 banking crisis. Hint, Bitcoin performed very well during both of those periods of extreme volatility and extreme fear. Okay. So we're going to look at that in a minute for Buddy Mac. Great question. Uh, holy shit, we got a $1.99 super chat from Kanakiki. Uh, thank you so much. Great work. Big fun. Thank you. Thank you for the shout out and thank you for the super chat. I really, really appreciate that. Um, I really do. Uh, I've had a few super chats this week and couldn't be more grateful. It, it still shocks me that people tune into my uh, my my bogan rants about economics and uh, geopolitics. Uh, so election year, Jack says it interesting. It is an election year in the US. The money printer is coming. The money printer was always going to come. And I think this here is the signal, okay? Uh, we can... I hope we can. I hope we can see the chart that I was going to show you. Okay. So this here is a chart of gold and real rates. And you can see very, very clearly, let me zoom that up and put my little, put my big head on a smaller screen. You can see typically over the past 15 years, this is actually a 20 year chart. Gold has followed real rates extraordinarily closely. Okay. Which is fascinating when you think about it. But it's only since 2022 that something in the markets has been a little bit different, okay? Something different has been happening in the markets over the past two years. Gold has diverged from real rates. So obviously, rates have been risen at the fastest pace over the past 50 years. That's the fastest interest rate hiking schedule since Volcker raised rates from like 10% to 20% in a matter of months, way back in the, was it early 1980s, I believe, that rate, uh, that rate hiking schedule happened. And most people thought, okay, interest rates are going up. This means that Bitcoin and gold would both be decimated because Bitcoin and gold both don't offer you, oh, fireworks are happening again. Uh, I'll, I'll get, we're gonna get, put my other hand behind my back. Most people thought that when interest so aggressively, Bitcoin and gold would have got crushed. They would have sold off aggressively because if interest rates are higher and if they're at five and a half percent in the US, that means all of a sudden you can get five and a half percent interest rates on a quote unquote risk free US Treasury note. I mean, most people think the US Treasury note is, you know, this safe haven asset. And every single time that we've seen a recession over the past 45 years, uh, you actually see bonds get bid. People buy bonds because they are the safe and liquid asset. Well, guess what? Not anymore. Nobody's buying bonds anymore. And especially since 2020, the first oh, we have playing in the background. I uh, I apologize. There's a, somebody somebody in the chat says treasuries are return free risk. I couldn't agree more. Let me know if my audio is still working or not, guys. Um, I'm currently just in the background trying to 
heard off what is actually going on. I don't know. I don't know what video is in the background there. Um, but I, I think it's very clear. Something is different. Something has changed. Something all of a sudden is different. Uh, is something is different in 2022? Okay, so I, I hope you guys' audio is working. Thank you, Dingo Booty. Uh, thank you, thank you. I had a little bit of background noise. I apologize for that. Okay, so why is gold diverging? Well, it's because central banks all around the world are buying gold at some of their fastest rates in history. If you, if I were to actually pull up a chart, you guys would be able to see uh, gold being bought by, I'm going to try to pull it up live. Um, if we look at like a 50-year chart, you can see that central banks have aggressively been buying gold since 2008. And this is where, again, something fundamentally changed post-2008. After that global financial crisis, everybody's like, hang on a minute, I don't trust this fiat era. I don't trust US Treasury bonds. I don't trust paper fiat currency. I want real hard assets. I want gold. And I think you can see it pretty clear that central banks all around the world have been buying gold at aggressive rates. I mean, have a look at this chart here. 2022, or I think this is 2023, central banks bought more gold than they bought between 1970 and 2007. I'm going to say that again. In one year, in 2023, Central banks bought more gold than they had bought between 1980 and 2008. That's like a 30-year period, okay? Again, uh, very, very interesting, very, very strange. Uh, thank you so much to everyone in the chat looking after me, making sure my audio is good. Um I think so Dan M has a great question. Uh, let's have a look at the purchasing power gold. We'll circle back to that at the end of today's live stream. I want to first keep going through all of the charts that we have, okay? Firstly, pharaoh has got a great question. War equals Bitcoin bull run. Every time Trump threatened war, Bitcoin surged higher because wealthy Bitcoin whales can take their Bitcoin to bunkers till wars are over. Okay, that is a great comment, Pharaoh Towers. And it's a great point. And it's a point that I actually want to raise uh, to you guys um, through a video that I've got prepped for you. Okay, so again, forgive me. We're doing it live today. And today was a little bit of one of those uh, quickly prepared uh, live streams. But I know I have a video. And this is a video of Michael Saylor talking about what would happen to Bitcoin if the electricity gets shut off everywhere on earth for 10 years. So naturally, a lot of people are saying, hey, look, you know, uh, there's a war happening right now. Bitcoin's useless. The only thing that's good during a war is gold. And that is why gold has aggressively been rallying over the past two weeks, whereas Bitcoin has been selling off. Now, I don't think that's the case. And I'm going to explain why after after I play this video for you guys. But I think Michael Saylor explains it pretty well. So we're going to listen to this video here because it's the Giga Chat. Why not listen to another video of the Giga Chat? Bank of America could be wiped. Bitcoin is a nuclear-hardened protocol. It's it's pretty much the most robust, resilient. Bitcoin is a nuclear-hardened protocol. It's, it's pretty much the most robust, resilient thing the human race has yet to invent. For example... It's running uh, on on tens of thousands of nodes. You can't even identify the nodes. And there's an identical copy of the Bitcoin ledger on every one of them. So if all of the electricity got shut off everywhere on Earth and every computer failed everywhere on Earth for 10 years, the protocol just goes dormant for 10 years. And as soon as one person turns one node back on, the entire protocol comes back to life again. There's nothing like that, right? Uh, all your money in a bank and Bank of America can be wiped out with, you know, a keystroke. You go and you wipe out a few servers, you know, your building can be wiped out with a bomb, right? Lots of things can be wiped out, but, but, um, Bitcoin is the most resilient thing in cyberspace because it is so incredibly decentralized. You know, if you took if you took an entire country offline, that's irrelevant. In fact, we just saw last year during the China crackdown that China banned Bitcoin mining. They took 40 to 50 percent of the entire network offline. Half of Bitcoin mining was taking place in China. 
the network didn't miss a beat, not even for a minute. It just kept running completely secure. Point is so I think the Giga Chad raises many phenomenal points in that video there. Bitcoin is the most resilient digital network in the entire world. Okay. China, the world's the world, one of the most powerful nation states in the world said, you know what? We're going to go to war with Bitcoin. We're going to ban Bitcoin mining and we are going to attack all of the Bitcoin miners in the country. And guess what happened? Nothing. 60% of the global hash rate dropped offline in Bitcoin. After 14 days, the difficulty adjustment adjusted lower. And all of a sudden, the network continued chugging along perfectly fine. For about two weeks, it might have taken a little bit longer for the miners to find blocks because the difficulty was so high. And all of a sudden, 60% of the hash rate dropped offline. Uh, so instead of getting blocks every 10 minutes, we got blocks every 20 minutes or 22 minutes. But after 14 days, nothing happened. The, the network continued chugging along just fine. Okay, so Bitcoin is warproof money. Bitcoin is perfect money. Bitcoin is great money to use offline. Even if there is significant carnage in the world, uh, like the electricity grid going down. Okay, uh, there is, and I, I think this is a good time to show this image. In a world full of war and violence, Bitcoin is hope. Bitcoin is peace. And I, I think we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about, you know, what is happening, uh, you know, with, you know, war and all of this kind of nasty stuff that nobody likes to see uh, a little bit later on into today's video. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit more about the geopolitics of what is going on with Iran involving themselves in the war. Okay. So this chart is terrible and it's very blurry, uh, but you can see that Iran is, they've got the third largest amount of reserves in the world regarding uh, oil reserves. Okay. So uh, this is, again, it is a uh, something to be in, but to be aware of if Iran is entering a war in a pretty big way, uh, we could expect to see the price of oil rise, okay? And obviously, uh, this means big things for the markets uh, because if the price of oil rises, CPI is all, all of a sudden going to rise. And here we can also see another little uh, cool oil barrel chart uh, showing you which countries produce the most oil. And this is a 2022 chart. Uh, it might be too small for you guys to see, but Iran is in the top 10 oil producing countries around the world. So we've got the United States, number one, Saudi Arabia, number two, Russia, number three at 11,000 uh, barrels per day. And then we have the UAE, number four, Iraq, number five. And then we actually have Iran at, oh, sorry, we have Iran at number seven because we have Canada uh, producing five and a half thousand barrels of oil per day. Okay. Uh, so Again, I think it's uh, important to be aware of all of the different aspects of why this war is significant, uh, okay? Because there is lots of downstream effects of what is going on in the war, okay? And, uh, we got a lively chat. Uh, let's answer a few more questions. Dingo Booty is excited about about the future of Bitcoin, as am I, my friend, as am I. A world without war would be beautiful. Holy shit. Tony, Tony sent me $10 super chat. Dude, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, Tony has saved so many sats cutting his own hair for the past several years. Appreciate the videos. Thank you, Tony. I really, really, really appreciate that. Um, I have also been cutting my own hair for the last number of years. Uh, most people can probably tell because I've got wild haircut. It's a little bit all over the place. Maybe producer Pam can uh, bring me out my, uh, my, my little, my little hair cutting kits for me to show some of you guys who might not be aware, but thank you so much, Tony. I really appreciate that. And, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to use that, uh, to maybe upgrade my Airbnb and get some better, uh, internet connectivity for the live streams. Uh, a couple of you guys might've tried to see the live stream I had earlier for the Bitcoin news YouTube channel. And I had a little bit of issues, um, with that. So I apologize to any of you guys who are on that live stream. I'm going to save that live stream for tomorrow. Okay. Uh, producer Pam's got me the goodies. And look at this. So this here, this, this puppy cost me about $10 and you have no idea how much money I've saved from, uh, haircuts, uh, with my own little, uh, hair cutting kit. 
got the professional scissors as well. So me and Tony are on the same page there. Some people might be joining the live stream and thinking, what is this gringo doing talking about haircuts? He doesn't look like he's had a haircut in a decade. Uh, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, the geopolitics of what is going on right now in the space, okay? Because it is wild, it is hectic, nobody knows what is happening. Uh, but I think all of it can be explained by this, okay? It can all be explained by debt, government debt. And I want to show you that the last time the United States had debt to GDP ratios above 100% was back in the 1940s. Now, what happened in the 1940s? Of course, we had World War II one of the more bloodiest wars that we've had in human history. And again, ask yourself, uh, I, I, I'm, I, sorry, I'm going to be really careful of what I say on YouTube. Uh, let's just say it's, it was interesting that we saw all of these wars in World War II when the, de when the governments all around the world were more indebted than they had been in 80 years. And think about all of the other, let's say, tyrannical measures that were also introduced in the 1930s and the 1940s when the world was incredibly indebted. Okay. FDR took over America in the 1930s. He was elected president and he is largely known as a socialist president. He enacted so many laws that stripped rights away from citizens and turned America into a little bit more of a socialist state. Okay. So again, I think that is uh, very, very interesting. Uh, something else that is interesting is the fact that uh, government debt levels today are at their highest level that they have been in over 80 years, okay? The last time, oh, fireworks again. The last time that we had debt levels above 100% uh, was, again, the 1940s. And don't you think it's interesting that all of a sudden today in the 2020s, we're seeing all of these massive wars break out for the first time in 80 years, okay? Some people are saying we're on the precipice of World War III, Again, that's just what some people are saying. We've got the Russia-Ukraine war breaking out. And of course, America is a little bit involved in there if you have a look at who's supporting who. Uh, so again, multiple countries engaged in a war. Similar thing happening with today with the escalation uh, with the Israel-Palestine war. It looks like Iran's getting more involved. So a lot of people are saying, look, this is strange. We're on, we could be on the precipice of World War III. Why? Ask yourself the question, why are we on the precipice of World War III? Does it have something to do with the fact that our governments are more indebted than they have been in 80 years? And maybe they need an excuse to print money, devalue the money, and pay back their debt with the devalued dollars? Just asking a question, not making any assertions. Uh, I'm going to read you guys a little bit more about an article I wrote in 2021, actually talking about you know, what happened in the 1940s at the end of that long-term debt cycle? And why were there so many wars in the 1940s? As you can see, it's a little bit of a long puppy. It's about eight, it's about 8,000 words. And it, it was essentially my thesis for what's happening in the 2020s. And this is way back in 2021. And I said, look, we're at the very end of a long-term debt cycle. Uh, inflation is not going to be transitory. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but I want to read you guys a passage of this article. And you can see in the images here, these are the uh, war bonds that the American government tried to use uh, to raise money for the war back in the 1940s. But naturally, most people didn't want to buy the war bond. So you can see the kind of propaganda that was used. Let me make this nice and big for you guys. So you guys can kind of see the propaganda that was used. You serve by saving, buy war saving certificates. That's one of the propaganda pieces they used in the 1940s, World War II. If you can't enlist in the war, invest, buy a liberty bond, defend your country with your dollars. Oh, look at this. It's always for freedom, for freedom's sake. Buy war bonds for freedom. It's always strange. It's always freedom or safety. Same thing with 2020. It's only 14 days to flatten the curve. It's for your safety. It's for freedom. Again, I, I'm not going to, I get triggered when I talk about those kind of things. So I'm, I'm not going to say too much about it. But again, I, th I think you can see it pretty clearly. During the conclusion of the long-term debt cycle in the 1940s, policymakers struggled to gain the votes of the people to accept the extreme currency debasement and financial repression needed to decrease the nominal debt load that the US had. So the U.S. sold it to the people that it was their patriotic duty in the face of an incoming World War II to purchase deeply negative yielding war bonds 
for the country's quote unquote freedom. Okay. So again, they, inflation was very hot in the 1940s. It was incredibly hot. I'm sure I have a chart of inflation uh, about the 1940s somewhere in this 9,000 word debacle of an article that I wrote back in 2021. Uh, don't tell me I can't find it. Come on. Look at how many images in this puppy. This is essentially like the thesis for my book. I don't know if you guys know, but I've been trying to force myself to write a book. I've got about 60,000 words uh, there. This article is about 8,000 of those words. Um, and I do have a, have a, I do want to try to push a book out, but I'm thinking that's probably going to be a, a bear market thing. It's probably going to be something to focus on in the bear market. I think I've got the highest amount of leverage focusing on YouTube. I think that's the quickest way for me to orange pill people. Uh, so again, I, I apologize. I can't find the chart of the 1940s inflation. You're just going to have to trust me. Okay. There was seriously high inflation in the 1940s. You actually saw three large spikes of inflation in the 1940s. Uh, and uh, each time people called it transitory. And each time people thought it was over. But we can see here, let's go back to the article. Similarly, in 2021, the US and most central banks globally look set to attempt to inflate away their debt and debase their currencies in the name of fighting the quote unquote war on the Cerveza sickness. So again, you guys can see the images that I, include, I included in this 2021 article. Trump labels himself a wartime president combating the Cerveza sickness. And we can also see here, the Cerveza sickness calls for wartime economic thinking. So why is there all these narratives about the need for wartime finance and wartime economics? Well, it's because we have more debt than we've had since World War II, the last time we had a war. And just think about it. The America left Afghanistan for the first time in 20 years in 2022, early 2022 from memory, or maybe it was late 2021. Don't quote me on that. But do you find it suspicious that we left Afghanistan and only months later, the Russia-Ukraine war started? Again, I, I'm not making any assertions. I have to be very careful about what I say on YouTube, but it's interesting. It's very, very interesting that we're just seeing endless wars pop up all around the world. Okay. Let's go back to this article. I'm nearly finished showing you the piece I wanted to show you in here. Um, but again, after the historic 2008 bailouts and Occupy Wall Street protests, it would be politically untenable to not have an excuse for the QE infinity monetary policy that central banks have embarked on since 2020. Just look at the debasement of fiat currency up by 5x since the year 2000 alone. Okay, so again, I, I think it's interesting, okay? And I, I, I think that when you look beneath the surface, you can kind of see what is happening in regards to war. Now, again, today I saw this video pop up. Again, notice the timing of this video. This video is talking about cashless banking and a cashless society being rolled out in Australia. Do you think it's interesting timing that, you know, this escalation of this attack on cash is happening today while the world's distracted with war? Again, only last week, there was a protest in Australia. It was a draw out your cash day where everybody went to the local bank and pulled out their cash in protest of the attack on cash that has been going on over the past years in Australia, since 2020. Again, I was in Australia in 2020 and 2021. The attack on cash was massive, okay? And they were passing all sorts of laws trying to accelerate this demonization of cash. So I want to play you guys this video because it popped across my timeline literally today. And again, just think about the timing that we're seeing these things. She'd forgotten her F5. Well, outrage in Queensland tonight after a local woman rocked up to her bank to withdraw cash, only, be, only to be told they didn't have any. Taryn Compton wanted to grab some notes to pay a tradie, but when she got to the ANZ ATM, she realised she'd forgotten her FPOS card when she asked the teller for the money instead. She was told the bank doesn't carry cash. And Taryn Compton's here to tell us all about her terrible banking experience. Taryn, what did you think when you walked into a bank only to be told they don't have cash? <laughs> 
thought it was absolutely crazy. I thought she must have misheard what I wanted, if I'm honest. How can you go to a bank and not be able to get your own money out? Taryn, that's what I'm confused about. So what's in the bank if there's no cash? Isn't there, a, like, in the, if you open up the safe, what's in there? What is, how did they explain it to you? They just said, I'm so sorry, we can't help you. There's nothing we can do. We don't have cash here. So did you think maybe that was a temporary situation, that maybe they were going to get some cash tomorrow? <laughs> No, she actually said we don't carry cash anymore. Well, outrage in Queensland tonight. After Banks in Australia no longer carry cash. Again, fascinating. Very, very, very interesting. Uh, banks all across Australia are going cashless and they're going cashless at an accelerated rate. Okay. Uh, let me take a look at chat. Oh, shit. Got another super chat. Uh, Jack, thank you, my friend. Really, really appreciate that. I really, really do. Um, you guys have been super generous this week. I really, really appreciate it. We've been, uh, we've been slogging away here on YouTube for a little while. I think we've been going live daily for the better part of two months now. So really appreciate all of the help. Um, again, we're on a mission. We want to orange pill everyone on YouTube. So much scammery and crypto nonsense. Uh, so again, your support, um, helps me. Uh, you know, accelerate that Bitcoin only mission. So thank you, Jack. Really appreciate it. Uh, that's the third super chat of today. We got Tony and we also have Kana Kiki. Thank you so much, guys. I really, really appreciate that. Um, okay. So uh, Mike's roasting me here in the chat. Markets are closed. What are you talking about? Bitcoin. Bitcoin is crashing. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mike. Should have been clearer with that. Uh, Bitcoin is crashing. Uh, well, it was. If we actually take a look at uh, the charts, I want to see what's happening with Bitcoin. Uh, because again, it, Bitcoin didn't stay down at $60,000 very long. As we showed you guys with this big red box, every time Bitcoin's kind of tapped that level, it's been bought up pretty quickly. Okay. Just interesting. Uh, something I'm watching and, you know, uh, this looks like for now, it's going to be very interesting to see what the markets do on Monday. That's all I'm going to say. I don't know where the price of Bitcoin is going in the short term. Again, I tell you guys that nearly every day. Absolutely nobody knows where the price of Bitcoin is going in the short term, especially me. So I don't know where it's going to go. Uh, so again, Bitcoin's crashing. The markets open up on Monday. It's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens. Also on Monday, Hong Kong could be releasing their Bitcoin spot ETF on Monday. And this is obviously a proxy for China, okay? Because Chinese citizens have access to everything that's happening in Hong Kong. Lots of Chinese citizens bank with Hong Kong uh, because that is kind of like their way to access the broader markets, okay? Again, there's capital controls in China, but China is allowed to get their money out of the country through Hong Kong. So pay attention. Uh, Monday could be a very, very, very interesting day. Uh, TT nailed what is going on. Uh, that is exactly what's happening. Iran is drone attacking Israel and that is most likely, most likely potentially starting World War III. Uh, perception management has always been, of course, there's uh, <laughs> all night hider. Uh, no grace for Luke. I always slip up. Let me have it, guys. If I'm wrong, call me out. I appreciate it. I do, I do. Uh, Federal Reserve notes are manipulated as final crypto is open 24 7. It's true, Jack. Uh, I want to tell me more in the chat, Dan. I don't know exactly what you mean with that. Uh, but I think, again, so there's a lot of war, there's a lot of noise in the world today. Okay. I think let's round out today's video talking about a little bit more signal. Okay. And I think it's some things we should be focusing on, okay? And this is, of course, a quote from Ron Paul, a man who wrote a book called End the Fed, and he campaigned on becoming the next president of America, the freest country in the world, on a political campaign of ending war and ending the central bank. At the time, most people thought Ron Paul was crazy, okay? It was only diehard libertarians, who supported Ron Paul. But he did get a significant size of the votership. He got a lot of popularity and he ruffled a lot of feathers campaigning back in an era where Keynesianism ruled supreme. Everybody loved government. Everybody was okay with 
turning a blind eye to all of the endless wars that were happening in the Middle East, being funded by the money printer, uh, the US money printer. And Ron Paul really kind of awakened a large crowd and a large, uh, what is it, intransigent minority of people to say, hang on a minute, I don't like central banking. I don't like money printing. Uh, money printing is theft. Inflation is theft. Taxation is theft. And it all, all of this, central banking, money printing helps fund war. Okay. And since Ron Paul campaigned on that message, uh, we've obviously seen other leaders all around the world get elected running on a similar campaign. Javier Millet, he's running, he's, he, he got elected in Argentina and his, you know, campaign message was, I will destroy the central bank. The state is a parasite. And I'm still shocked people voted for that in Argentina. Okay. Uh, it's incredible. So I think Ron Paul puts it nicely. It is no coincidence that the century of total war coincided with the century of central banking. Again, what happens since the US got a central bank in 1913? I'm glad you asked. I have, I have a tweet that I want to show you guys. Uh, so I posted this one just before I jumped on uh, this live stream with you guys. Why has there been an explosion of war since the beginning of the 1900s? World War I, World War II, the war in the Middle East, the 20-year war on terror against Afghanistan because they had weapons of mass destruction, which we later found out was a complete lie, a, co a complete fabrication. Uh, I mean, and then more recently, 2022, as soon as the war on terror in the Middle East ended, Russia and Ukraine war popped up in 2022. Interesting timing. And now we have the Israel and Palestine war, okay? And I tweeted, government's monopoly on violence comes from their ability to print money for free to fund endless wars. Bitcoin demonetizes war, okay? I think that is a little bit of signal to end today's video. Again, war is a horrible thing. War is a disgusting thing. I hate war more than anyone else. Um, but again, I think we should focus our message because I think a lot of people are thinking about war today. And I think a lot of people are nihilistic. A lot of people are hopeless. They think voting in the blue guy or the red guy is the solution to war. It's not both presidents, both sides of the aisle, whether you're in Australia, whether it doesn't matter if you vote liberal, labor, left or right, red or blue, the money printer is not going to be abolished. Okay. So I think Bitcoin is hope. Bitcoin demonetizes war, and I, I, I think that's all that matters. Uh, Ron Paul for World Emperor, Gun Blazer, well said. Uh, Ron and Rand Paul are the only good politicians, which is an oxymoron. It is an oxymoron, all night hider. There are no good politicians, but I do like Ron and his son, Rand. Double bottom, pre-halving. 80k short squeeze, price discovery post halving, 1.9 US dollars equivalent before the next halving. 2028, Dan M is incredibly bullish. I don't even know if I'm that bullish. I think there's probably a 30% probability we hit $2 million before the next halving, 2028. Actually, I'll give you it higher than that. I'll probably give you 50% probability. Um, I just cleaned out a bunch of firearms. Blue or red is a mirage. Couldn't believe, couldn't agree more with you, Steve. McLovin on the money. Couldn't agree more. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Central banks run the globe. Central banks run the globe. And that is why they're attacking the idea of freedom money so much. Okay, guys, I think that's all I've got for you. I, I, I think that's the most of the news that's happening right now in Israel and Iran. I am being very careful about what I talk about and what I cover, because again, I'm not an expert on any of these things. Uh, I am just interested about the, the economics of what is going on. Uh, I don't even want to show you that video because it had a little bit of a dodgy caption. Uh, Okay, guys, I, I think that's that's where I'm going to leave today's live stream. Tomorrow, you're going to get two. Tomorrow, you're going to get two live streams. I'm going to go live on my channel, 
And I'm also going to go live on the Bitcoin news channel. All Night Hider says, hit the like button before the video ends. I'd appreciate that. Thank you, guys. Everything you do, like button, sharing a video, uh, super chats, they help an enormous amount. Thank you so much. Everything you guys do uh, helps out the channel. So thank you so much. Uh, smashing the like button really does help me out. Uh, how do we connect to you, Luke? You can hit me up on Twitter, my friend, uh, Steve. You can also grab a free 15-minute consultation down below in the comments of today's video if you just want to chin wag or you want to ask me how i can help you level up your bitcoin custody uh thank you charles positivity is what it's all about guys i will oh i won't see you tomorrow because i want to say hello to chico chico's joined the chat right at the very end uh jan morgan someone new in the chat uh thank you so much with all that said guys i think i'm going to end this one here thanks for tuning in again let's think about positive things let's think about solutions everybody can point to the problems around the world today Everybody can identify a problem or a negative or complain about how bad things are. But again, we have a solution. So Bitcoin is hope. Bitcoin demonetizes war. Um, and let's try to educate as many people about that as possible. Um, for that said, I'm going to shut up. I've been talking for 41 minutes. Jeez, sorry, guys. Uh, see you tomorrow.